Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Church. My name is Linda Craft, and the scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Before I begin this morning, I just uh, want to say thank you guys. That was beautiful, that anthem. Uh, it's one of my favorite hymns, it is well, and delivered like that, gosh. But that's what we're talking about is wellness and how we get to the point where we say, it is well, it is well with my soul. We know his name, which when you think about it, is pretty remarkable. Most of the people whom Jesus healed, we don't know their names. We refer to them by their condition. We say the 10 lepers or the, the woman with the flow of blood or the paralytic who was carried by his friends. That's how we refer to them. But today's story, we know his name, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And, 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 and not only was did the gospel writers find it significant enough to share with us his name, but they also included his story in three out of the four gospels. Something happened on that road to Jericho that was significant, something worth telling other people about. Truth is, though, there's nothing about Bartimaeus that really seemed all that significant at first. I mean, he was like any number of blind beggars that you might see by the road. Think about how many people we pass and we're driving along who are begging by the road. How often do we stop and really pay attention to them? Bartimaeus was sitting along the road to Jericho. Interestingly enough, it's the same road that Jesus features in his story on the Good Samaritan. And he is dependent on good Samaritans you know, to, to see him, to notice him. And, and instead of passing by on the other side to come near and have mercy, he lives off the mercy of others. And this is how Bartimaeus' days go from day to day, sitting and waiting until one day there's a commotion on the road. A large crowd is coming through. And Bartimaeus asks someone nearby, says, what's happening? And someone in the crowd tells him, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He is coming by this way. Now at this point in Jesus' ministry, this is, this is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He's actually on his way to Jerusalem right now. And so by this point in his ministry, his, his name is established. It's, it's, it, his fame has grown. People know him to be a, a, a wise teacher, even a miracle worker. And so the spark of hope rises in Bartimaeus' chest and he begins to cry out, Jesus, son of God, son of David, have mercy on me. And one of the best sermons I've ever heard on this story 
came from a pastor named Reverend Grace Matthew. She came to St. Luke's as a visiting pastor when I served there, and she tells this story in a way that I could probably never recount, but, but many of the things I'm going to say kind of owe a debt of gratitude to her insight. I'll post a link later in the week for you to listen to it. It's, it's worth a half hour to listen to her take on this story. One of the things that she points out is the way in which Bartimaeus elevates the name of Jesus. When the crowd tells him, you know, who's passing by, they say Jesus of Nazareth, which as far as titles go, is very safe, very tame. It's accurate. It tells us where Jesus is from, Nazareth, but it doesn't say or claim anything more than that. It's non-controversial, right? But not what Bartimaeus does. Bartimaeus takes that that, that, that safe name of Jesus and he elevates it into risky territory because he gives Jesus a social political title. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. To say son of David is to make a claim about Jesus' lordship and kingship, about his identity, and in Caesar's Rome, to ascribe kingship and lordship to anyone else was dangerous territory. This is a title that can get you in trouble. This is a title that can get you killed. And so all the crowds around him begin instantly hushing him. Shh, shh, don't say that. You're gonna get us in trouble. Don't shout that name out loud. The, the, the word they use is, is a, they sternly order in Greek for him to be quiet. It's, it's used twice in the 10th chapter of Mark, in fact. Earlier in the chapter, there's this moment where all the children are coming to Jesus. And again, you see the disciples coming and rebuking and sternly ordering them to stay away. Uh, commentator Alan Culpepper, he says, this is the word used to keep the marginalized and powerless away from Jesus. But blind Bartimaeus will not be deterred. Even though the crowd tells him to be silent, he screams out even louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Even though he is blind, he perceives a truth about Jesus, or maybe he's just desperate, but he keeps crying out, until Jesus notices. And Jesus stops and says, who is this calling? Bring him to me. And the crowd parts and says to Bartimaeus, cheer up, take heart. He's heard you on your feet, go to Jesus. And so Bartimaeus takes his, his cloak, his outer robe, and he casts it off in order to go, you know, in his haste to get to Jesus. Now this is an interesting detail, the casting off of the cloak. What is that about? It, 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 perhaps it's just an indication of how excited and urgent he is, how, how quick his response, that he didn't want anything to get entangled or get in the way as he runs to Jesus in that moment. But Christians have interpreted this metaphorically. In, in light of Hebrews 12, 1, that tells us, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, to throw off everything that hinders and the sin which so easily entangles so commentator, Matthew Henry, whose, whose comments, commentaries line my father's shelves and mine in turn, he writes, those who would come to Jesus must cast off the garment of their self-sufficiency, must free themselves from every weight and the sin that like long garments most easily besets them. I love that phrase, the garment of their own self-sufficiency. That, I think, is getting a little closer to the truth. Grace and Matthew, she connects this moment to the work of Brene Brown. If you're not familiar with Brene Brown, she's an author, speaker, a, a leading researcher on the topic of shame in our culture. And what Brene Brown says is that we are all wired for connection. That's how God has connected us. And I love the way she defines connection she, as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they can derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. That's what connection is about. It's about life and being and wholeness. But there's something that gets in the way of authentic connection for all of us. And what gets in the way of connection is shame, which Brene Brown also defines 
for us as the intensely painful feeling or the experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Shame is that voice inside our head. It's not just, you know, the, the, the guilt we feel when we mess up. It's, it's the voice inside our head that tells us that we're not enough, that we're not smart enough, not important enough, not rich enough or wise enough or successful enough or thin enough, whatever it is that, that tells us we're not enough to be loved and accepted as we are. And we all have that voice inside our head. And so what do we do with shame? Well, we cover it up. Because we don't want anyone else to see this fear, this not enough that we carry. And so we cover it up. We, we, we create masks for ourselves or to take the image from the story. We craft outer garments that cover up our shame and our fear and project confidence and competence to each other. And we think this is how we connect by, by looking like we got it all together. But those masks, those walls, they actually get in the way of true and authentic connection, Brene Brown tells us. Now she says the root of true authentic connection, like when she studies people who have healthy relationships, they have all people who've learned to work through shame, who've learned to be vulnerable with each other, to take down those outer garments and walls. She writes, vulnerability is the first thing I look for in you and the last thing I'm willing to show you but it's in vulnerability that we have authentic relationships. So if we want to have an authentic relationship with Jesus, if we really want to connect to Jesus and experience his healing in our lives, we have to be willing to cast off, to cast off that outer garment of self-sufficiency, that outer garment that says we got it all together in order to be laid bare before our healer. This is what Bartimaeus does, and he stands before Jesus, and Jesus asks him a singular question. What do you want me to do for you? It's such a simple question, but such a loaded question all the same, right? And, 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 and the answer seems obvious, Jesus, doesn't it? He's blind. He wants to see. He's, he's a beggar. He's poor. He wants money. He wants something. Why do you have to ask him, Jesus? Isn't it obvious what he wants? But again, I defer to Grace and Matthew who says, this is not a question, but rather an invitation. What do you want me to do for you is an invitation for us to participate in our own healing. What do you want me to do for you is, is, is an invitation to name our need because part of our healing depends upon our ability to name it. Jesus is daring you, daring me to look our demon, our dragon in the eye and to name it. What is it that you want me to do for you is a double dog dare you to name it. Do you have the guts to name it before Jesus? Do you have the guts to believe it's possible for him to heal you? Bartimaeus does. Interestingly enough, this question that Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? He asked it to lots of people, not just Bartimaeus. In fact, if you just back up 15 verses in the chapter, there's another instance where someone comes to Jesus with a request. In this case, it's two of his disciples who've been following him in the desert for all this time, James and John, but they come to him with a very specific request. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, okay, here's what we want. When you come into your kingdom, we want to sit at your right and your left in the seats of power and responsibility and authority. That's what we want. And when Jesus hears, I imagine he had some kind of disappointment in his heart. He says, that I cannot do for you. 
Because when he gives them the opportunity to name, they don't name the need, the brokenness of their heart. They don't name their dragon or the demon. All they name is one bigger cloak. I just want more authority, more power, where I can sit in the seat of judgment. They don't name where they need their deepest healing. They don't name what they need. They name what they want. Bartimaeus does the opposite. He says, Rabbi, I want to see again. Did you catch that word? I want to see again, which means at some point Bartimaeus could see and he's lost this ability and he's simply asking for his sight to be restored, for something that he's lost to be found again. What would again look like in your life right now? And what do you pray for again? Is it a sense of hope? That, God, I've lost my my hope for our country, our community, and and I want to have hope again. Is it a, a passion? a sense of joy and energy in the work you do, that that once upon a time I I went into this and I felt so called and I attacked it with such energy and all that seems lost, it's it's ground away in the minutia and 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 the drudgery of my job. I want, I want, I want to feel passion and energy again. Or is it in relationships? Places where there used to be love, tenderness, kindness, connection, and now that connection feels gone, and you say, God, I just want to be whole again. Bartimaeus says, Jesus, Rabbi, I want to see again. And Jesus replies, go. You've chosen wisely. Your faith has made you well. Now, those last couple words, made you well, it depends on what translation of the Bible you read as far as what words appear. And, and, and the translation that Linda Kraft used earlier, the NIV says, your, your faith has healed you. But many other translations say, your faith has saved you, which is a very big word, saved. It carries a lot of freight. I grew up in a tradition where when we talked about the word saved, it meant your eternal destination. And you were either saved or unsaved. And the way you got saved was by inviting Jesus into your heart. And and being saved meant that someday when you died, you would get to go to heaven. And we'd have all these debates about, once you're saved, can you lose your salvation? Is it it something you can lose? Once saved, always saved? Or or, all these conversations about being saved. And, And for me, when I got to seminary and learned the richness of this word, the Greek word is sozo, that I learned in the New Testament, it didn't just refer to an eternal destination, what happens to us after we die, but it often was used about realities in the here and now. And sometimes it meant rescue, to deliver from, from danger or threat, but, but, but it's used just as often, often in connection with Jesus' healings to refer to someone being made well, to refer to someone being made whole, forgiven, inside and out. So the Bible says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To work out your salvation, it means like for God's healing and wholeness to be made manifest in our lives. That's what salvation is about. And I wanna be really clear that we don't get made well by our own effort and our own design. Healing comes from Jesus alone. When we think we can do it by our own energy and by our own effort, more often than not, we just make a prettier cloak to show to people, to cover up our fear and our hurt. No, it's Jesus who brings forgiveness and hope and healing down to the depth of our being. He's the one who is the author of salvation and the giver of grace. Our part in the process is to be willing to be vulnerable, to take off our cloak and be willing to be seen, and then to listen to our heart and to dare to name our hurt 
and our brokenness and our need. And once we've done that, then we trust. We have faith. We place our lives, we surrender our lives into Jesus' hands and we allow him to work out his healing and his salvation in our midst. That's what it means to be made well. And it's by faith that we, like Bartimaeus, are saved. In just a moment, I'm gonna invite Reverend Kim King to join me. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Kim, who may not have seen her in a couple services we did last year, uh, Kim is joining us on Sunday mornings as part of our pastoral team and staff. Kim and I work together at St. Luke's, and I'm so thankful for her friendship, and I'm specifically thankful because in addition to being an ordained clergy member, she's also a licensed marriage and family therapist. And so she brings an expertise and knowledge to these topics of, of healing and wellness that uh, I, I know is going to benefit us as a church. So in just a moment, Kim's going to join me in conversation, but before she does, we have a song of reflection that our choir is going to sing. And as you listen to this music, I just want to invite you to listen also to your own heart and think about the story of Bartimaeus and what part of the story is ringing in your ears this morning. Is it Bartimaeus' cry, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me? Is it Jesus' question, what do you want me to do for you? Is it part of Maus' response? Lord, I want to see again. Take this time and ask yourself, what do you need to say to Jesus? And what is Jesus saying back to you? Well, I want to thank Kim for joining me. and. Uh, Thanks, Kim, for being here. I, I'm curious, uh, based on your experience as someone who works in the mental health profession with people who are seeking mental wellness, uh, how has, what's been the effect of this last year? You know, everything's happening in our world with COVID and the disruption. What, what have you seen? Yeah, so Dave, um, living in and navigating through a pandemic is something none of us has had to do before. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's very traumatic. We've all been traumatized by this pandemic. So um, people are um, struggling somewhat. I know that uh, last March when, you know, they said, go home, I figured, you know, we'll be home two, three weeks. And then yeah, when I closed the church, <laughs> I, I thought two weeks, <laughs> yeah. three, back. Yeah. Back to business as usual. <laughs> but, you know, one thing that happens when we experience trauma is that there's sometimes a lot of... Um, shock and denial, so maybe that was <laughs> shock and denial on our part. Uh, but other things that might happen, are, you know, people experience um, some emotions that are unfamiliar or confusing to them, anxiety, fear, loneliness, there are even physical symptoms of trauma, insomnia, um, agitation, so I think people are feeling some of all of those, but the thing that I hope people remember is that whatever your response is, um, it's a trauma response, and your response is a normal response to an abnormal event. Right, and, it's, and we've all been living through it, so yeah. we've all been affected. I, I know we have a, a graphic with some statistics. Uh, I don't know if people at home can read all of those statistics, but they're not good. Uh. Yeah, I mean, people's report of experiencing mental illness is up 19%. Um, you know, our youth are uh, especially impacted up. 12%. Um, so things are, you know, everything's up. Everything bad is up. And people are seeking support more. So I hope that that's the silver lining, you know. And I also hope that um, we've now got an ability to talk about mental illness and emotional distress and sort of normalize and destigmatize that. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is. You know, the stories of the Bible often present healing as kind of like this instantaneous thing, you know, like boom, it happens. And often it's observable because it's an outward condition that gets healed. But, yeah. but when it comes to inner healing, is it like that? Is it instantaneous or are there breakthrough moments or is it more like kind of an ongoing slow process of healing? Yeah, I'm going to say yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I've worked with people whose distress is uh, almost completely alleviated in a month or two. And then I've worked with folks who I've worked with for more than 10 years whose healing is more slow, you know, sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not, but it's ongoing uh, over a period of time. You know, mental illness can be situational or chronic. 
what role does faith play in that? So yeah, in my experience, I'm glad you asked that because it's a great question. Uh, folks who have a belief in God or some power bigger than and outside of themselves, to me, seem to heal in a more deep, more sustainable way. Um, people who actually like invite God into the work. Now, I think God is present in the work with us, regardless of whether we make that uh, public, but clients who express uh, a belief in God and have some sort of um, belief around spirituality and invite God into the work, you know, or like Bartimaeus, like, you know, Jesus, son of David, like come and be in this with me, um, seem to just heal in a different, more profound way. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, God's not a genie that we wish and boom, it happens, but I like that you said it's not just about, it's not a shortcut to healing, but it is a pathway to deeper and uh, deeper healing and and wholeness. Um, One of the things, Kim and I were kind of, prepping for this series for, I don't know, back in December, and, um, and we were talking about it, and you share with me a quote that is on your bulletin board. Uh, I think it may even be a quote of your own making. <laughs> I think I made it up, but I'm <laughs> but, not But exactly I love the sure. phrase, that it says, uh, we must, uh, how does it, we, we have to be relentless partners. Yeah, we have to relentlessly participate in our own. Relentlessly participate yeah, in, in our, our own, own healing. healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that God is always there, but God is wanting to be with us in relationship with us as we're in relationship with each other and the more we participate the more blessing there is the more healing there is the more wholeness there is so from your perspective what are some of the things that get in the way of our participation that kind of keep us from pursuing the healing that god offers yeah i love that you uh, spend some time on shame and vulnerability because i think that all of us have these negative messages swirling around in our heads you know messages that we sort of uh, internalized as children because our parents or teacher or coach said something to us, like something we couldn't do, something we shouldn't do, something we were, which we weren't. Uh, But we sort of have a tendency to hook on to negative bias and hold on to those things. And especially when we're stressed, I think those negative messages sort of swirl around. So if we can learn to manage those, because we're probably not ever gonna just completely get rid of them. But if we can learn to manage those messages, then I yeah. think that that uh, opens up a pathway to healing. Yeah, and manage isn't the same as bury, because I think that's what a lot of us do, is we, we bury those messages or that hurt. You know, I think um, you know, the cloak that I think a lot of us wear is this cloak of being fine. Mm-hmm. Like when people ask, how are you doing? Or how are things going? We all kind of have this standard fine. response. I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> like there's this uh, meme that uh, uh, came from Ross and friends, this moment where he finds out Joey and Rachel are dating and his response is, I'm fine, it's fine, everything's fine. You know, like yeah. that's what we do in our culture is we just keep saying things are fine, but, mm-hmm. but that's just hiding. And, and I guess one thing I wanna make sure everyone hears is that fine is not well. Like we can say things are fine, but that doesn't mean we're well inside. And sometimes we have to be willing for things not to be fine in order to finally get well. You know what I mean? Yeah, and just naming the thing that isn't, you know, um, that isn't fine. It's often liberating, you know, that it's the, this thing isn't fine. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk about. I mean, people come to therapy to talk about the things that aren't fine, the things that are um, stressing them out, the things that they've done wrong, you know, or the mistakes they've made. But it's, it's amazing how just giving voice to brokenness uh, creates wholeness and healing. Great space for that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that's the one I want to close with, is just kind of creating space for healing. Because one of the things we want to do in this series is every week we want to offer a spiritual discipline, something that people can do in the week ahead in order to pursue healing in their life. And, um, and so our spiritual discipline that we want everyone to try this week is silence. And why don't you say a little bit more about that, Kim? Well, you know, in light of everything that's going on and there's so much noise in the world. I mean, we listen to podcasts while we're exercising. We have music or the TV on as background noise. When we're working, we go to sleep to white noise, right? right. So I want us to, I want to invite us to um, lean into some personal solitude to create some silence for ourselves, just to try it every day, maybe this week. You know, five, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, don't start with 15, maybe start with five, start with five. you know, yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, if yeah. you're not used to silence. And, um, 
And I know you had this great quote that I loved. Uh, it was Susan... Uh, Susan Muto. Muto. Yeah, she says, in a noise polluted world, it is even difficult to hear ourselves think, let alone try to be still and know God. Yet it seems essential for our spiritual life to seek some silence, no matter how busy we may be. Silence is not to be shunned as empty space, but to be befriended as fertile ground for intimacy with God. I love that. Yeah. Not empty space, mm-hmm. but fertile ground. Mm-hmm. So how do we do that? So we have another slide, I think. Oh, another slide, yeah. Um, yeah. And so we need to create some intentional space. So find a space in your home where you can do this every day, a space where um, the distractions are low, where um, the noise is outside of that room. Um, and, you, and TV, technology, phone screens, you're, you're, just, you know, it doesn't... Yeah. Just, not in that space with you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, you need to turn your technology off and down. Um, and I want you to set an intentional time. So I want you to schedule this because we all know that if we don't put it on the calendar, it probably won't get done. And so I want you to make a holy appointment um, for this intentional space and time with God. Um, I want you to set a timer so that you're not constantly looking up at the clock because yeah. you will be. <laughs> a lot of times you're like 90 seconds <laughs> it, in, you're like, right, how many minutes am I still it? listening? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and then I want you to turn all that technology off and just lean into the, to the silence. Like, what do you hear in the silence? What do you feel in the silence? Yeah. You know, I want you to listen with intention because I believe that when we create silent spaces, we also create holy ground that's fertile for us to hear the whisper of God and, and to lean into our own sacred personhood. Yeah. Know? So that's our encouragement this week. Everyone set aside five, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you're comfortable with, and just be silent with God, yeah, with God. And, and seek God in that silence. And if you're not sure kind of what to listen for, I, I maybe offer that question that Jesus asked to Bartimaeus, that just listen to, to God asking, what do you want me to do for you? And see what raises up mm-hmm. in your spirit. Um, we're we're going to transition to communion, but as we do so, uh, uh, one last thing about the story of Bartimaeus, that after he was healed, then it says he continued and followed Jesus on the way. Like it wasn't like he was healed and went off his own way. It was like his healing led to ongoing discipleship, mm-hmm. ongoing following of Jesus. And, and I even love the followed him on the way, that, that the way could have been literally the road of Jericho, but also the way can expand in meaning to include like the, the following Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And then as we follow Jesus' way of living, yeah. that's one way of seeking his ongoing healing and work in our lives. Mm-hmm.